thank you for coming to this uh, very special evening that we have uh, with a guest who brings a great deal of experience and wisdom to a very complicated and difficult subject. Um, David Sheffer is a former colleague of mine and a, a friend who has uh, worked very hard over two decades now on the issue of war crimes and international justice and the efforts to build institutions of justice. These are extremely tough issues uh, because they involve many different kinds of conflicts, not only the conflicts on the ground that are being resolved through the issues of accountability, hopefully, uh, rarely full resolution, but also conflicts within governments, um, conflicts within the government that he will talk to you about, the U.S. government. Uh, we worked on these issues uh, together in the 1990s when David was a senior advisor to the U.S. Ambassador, uh, Madeleine Albright, U.N. U.S. Ambassador at that time, and then when uh, Madeleine Albright became Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, uh, she created a new position, a very important position that had never existed before in any government, to my knowledge, and that was the position of ambassador at large for war crimes issues, and she named David Sheffer as the person to hold that uh, position. I was then the Assistant Secretary of State uh, for Human Rights and Democracy and Labor, so we had many reasons to work together. It was extremely tough going, um, much more difficult, of course, for those who were the victims of war crimes, certainly, than us. Um, and in the beginning, there was no success. I think it's very important to put that right out front. I'm sure David will elaborate on that. But only horrific crises and massive killings, uh, killings uh, amounting to genocide in a number of uh, countries, Rwanda in 1994, Bosnia before 1995, um, and the U.S. and European allies were largely unwilling to confront uh, the massive nature of these atrocities that were being committed in the immediate period after the end of the Cold War. And in many ways, the lowest point, but I would say also the turning point, I, I'd be interested to see whether you agree with this, David, the lowest point and the turning point was Srebrenica, which of course uh, all of you know is now synonymous with uh, horrific uh, crimes against humanity and genocide, the largest genocide in Europe since the Second World War, of course. Um, and slowly, uh, but certainly too late for hundreds of thousands of Rwandans <coughs> and uh, Bosnians and Croatians, and others who were victimized during this period, slowly new institutions of justice were built. And the <clears throat> endless cycle of impunity began to be challenged. And David Sheffer was really at the heart of this, and he'll tell you about it. He's written a, uh, a very compelling book, new book published this month, uh, All the Missing Souls, A Personal History of the War Crimes Tribunals. And there are really two major themes uh, in this book as I see it. The first theme is, of course, the conflict between peace and justice, justice and the institutions of justice that get created, and some observations by David about how, in some instances, that conflict can be resolved. A second theme, and a very important one, and I think showing the, both the courage and the honesty of the writer, is David is very directly critical of uh, some of the policies of his own government, um, the ambivalence of the United States in many respects uh, toward issues of international justice, committed deeply to building international criminal tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, and even strongly committed, at least uh, theoretically, to the creation of an international criminal court, but um, never willing, uh, even in some respects until today, uh, and continuing uh, today, to have the instruments of international justice fully uh, directed in, on, on the country that was its most ardent uh, champion, the United States. So, 
some would say ambivalence, others would say double standard, and it's a certainly reasonable uh, conclusion that one might draw. David looks this issue directly in the eye, and uh, I think uh, what he has to say about um, this challenging effort to develop an international justice system in the International Criminal Court is, is quite profound. I think despite having to carry out some of uh, the policies uh, of the U.S. government that he disagreed with in some cases, his achievements in promoting international justice over these two decades have been profound. And uh, let me say that very clearly, that the institutions that have been created, many of them uh, have his direct and personal involvement and something that he can be proud of and we should all be pleased to be able to hear from him about it. Uh, David is the Hellman Professor of Law and the Director of the Center for International Human Rights at Northwestern University and the author in addition to his new book, which I see is uh, available outside if you are able to uh, purchase one, I'm sure that would be welcome. I think you'll find it fascinating reading. He's the author of numerous articles on human rights and international justice. Um, his lecture will be moderated by my distinguished colleague uh, from the Legal Studies Department, Renata Uitz, uh, who has great experience herself in issues of international justice and, uh, and comparative constitutional law. So please join me in welcoming Ambassador David Sheffer to the podium uh, here at CEU. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, President Shattuck, John, for that uh, very kind and gracious introduction. And it's a tremendous pleasure for me to be with you and to have Renata here with me as well um, at the uh, Central European University. It's my first visit uh, to this university. The last time I was in Budapest, um, Oh, there were a couple of fast flybys to Bosnia, as I recall, uh, in the 90s, but uh, really the, the visit that I recall most prominently was flying into the city in January of 1994 on a military aircraft with General Shalikastravili and with Ambassador Albright for the purpose of uh, initiating negotiations with the government of Hungary for uh, entry into the Partnership for Peace which was an opening step to NATO membership. And sitting in some grand chandeliered hall, you know, and we were just gloriously in Budapest, and I was trying to focus on, on policy while looking at the, the grandeur of the city at the same time, because you don't get any time when you're zipping from one country to the next on these diplomatic missions to ever, ever enjoy anything. So it's been a great pleasure to be here, to walk your streets, uh, walk across the Danube a couple of times, and I think all of you are extremely fortunate uh, not only to be in this city, but also to have John Shattuck as the president here. Um, you know, he's kind of a hero of mine, and if you read the book, you'll see what I mean in terms of being my partner in the pursuit of justice, uh, particularly during the first Clinton term and into the second term, when he went off to become ambassador to the Czech Republic, of course, he entered the, the European stream, and uh, I, I didn't work with him that closely in the final two years. But certainly for six years, it was a very close relationship, and um, my book describes uh, many of those moments when uh, President Shattuck actually made the difference uh, for justice. Um, in those uh, critical years. I'm going to talk about what is really a transformational moment in history, which is the 1990s in connection with international justice. Now, I am extremely aware, I am an academic, uh, have been ever since uh, the, uh, 2003, after the Clinton administration, uh, and I am extremely aware of the literature the scholarship, and the ever, ever present cynicism about everything going on, uh, including with the war crimes tribunals. So I, I think I've kind of seen almost all of it. Uh, and yet I do remain an optimist, and I want to describe how in this book I try to, to 
relate the story of how did we build these tribunals? Where did we start on Terra Nova with each tribunal? Of course, we had precedents to look at. Uh, for the Yugoslav tribunal, we did have the Nuremberg and Rwanda, uh, Nuremberg and Tokyo military tribunals after World War II, which informed us but they were not sufficient whatsoever for the complete task ahead of us. Um, we had to work within a UN structure uh, with UN lawyers, uh, with an international community represented in both the Security Council and the General Assembly in the creation of both of those two particular tribunals. And that was a very different dynamic from what our predecessors had uh, had uh, undertaken after World War II with both the Nuremberg Tribunal and the Tokyo Tribunal. Uh, it's often viewed as victor's justice after World War II. That's the allegation, of course, for both Nuremberg and Tokyo, and even some judges on those panels claimed it was so. Um, in the 1990s, it really was not victor's justice. It was more seen as the, the, ju the, the justice and intervention of the strong over the weak, essentially. And we were able to do that through the vehicle of the Security Council and the authority of the Security Council under Chapter 7. Um, <clears throat> and you can, you can obviously critique that, uh, and I've seen the critiques, you know, as to the fairness or unfairness of the strong imposing justice upon the weak. Um, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon that in early 1993, particularly in February of 1993, by what legal authority were we creating a war crimes tribunal? Well, uh, the work that had immediately preceded us in 1992 looked at the treaty model as the basis for doing so. That was a very conventional way of thinking about creating a court. You get countries to sign on to a treaty, they agree to be subject to the jurisdiction of a particular new court, and you go from there. We also knew that that was impossible to create with respect to the former Yugoslavia unless we had a 10-year timeline to deal with. So we needed something much faster than that because accountability was screaming for attention after 1992 and what had happened in the Balkans during 91 and 92. Um, and we we took, a, we took a leap, and that was looking at Article 41 of the UN Charter, determining that non-military measures by the Security Council could include the creation of an international criminal tribunal uh, for the purpose of addressing accountability for crimes which, if so addressed, might have an impact, a favorable impact, on the threat to international peace and security that emanated from the Balkans. So we had our, our legal justification for doing so in the UN Charter and through the Security Council. And uh, we, uh, we executed our policy in that vein with strong support by our European allies and uh, ultimately by Russia and China uh, in the Security Council for the purpose of building the Yugoslav War Crimes Tribunal. Um, that legal authority was then translated again during the Rwanda situation. We looked to the Security Council again for that legal authority. Uh, and again, we were still sort of feeling our way on Terra Nova as to the legitimacy of all of this. It wasn't until the judges themselves began to look back at this in the initial cases, Akayesu for Rwanda, Tadic for the Yugoslav Tribunal, to examine the, the, the issue of legitimacy and whether or not the UN Charter actually granted this kind of authority uh, and whether the courts were properly constituted. Um, we won those arguments in those courts. Uh, their, legi their legitimacy was, in fact, validated. And I say all of that because <clears throat> in those very, very early years, we somehow had to establish a new foundation for international justice. The foundations that had been set just after World War II were actually almost completely inaccurate, uh, in, uh, 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 incomplete and uh, uh, did not really satisfy the needs of the 1990s, which were far more complex. I write in the book how as much as we honor those who drafted the London Charter and the Tokyo Charter and 
prosecuted in those tribunals. Frankly, the task that confronted us in the 1990s was a far more complex task because it was not victor's justice per se. We actually had to bring the so-called international community on deck and approve every step of the way in this process. Uh, and that proved to be a negotiating challenge. And the book tries to tell that story with each of the five major tribunals. How did we initiate the negotiations? How did we carry through with the negotiations? Who did we partner with in the negotiations? What were the human stories associated with the negotiations? Um, and that's for the Yugoslav Tribunal, the Rwanda Tribunal, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia, and the permanent international criminal court. So you have five path-breaking tribunals that we take sort of for granted today, but for years through the 1990s, each one was a major struggle negotiating it, as well as initially implementing uh, the creation, the organization, the administration, and the early cases of each of those tribunals. So if you read this book, you're not going to read about literally the jurisprudence of the tribunals and all of the cases that then followed and were prosecuted before the tribunals. I can assure you many scholars, perhaps some in this room, have written many books about the jurisprudence of the war crimes tribunals by now. This is one of the most favorite academic subjects that exist now. Um, this book is an attempt to really relate the story of, of being present at the creation uh, and what that constitutes uh, in terms of international justice and how you work your way through an enormously complex mixture of political, legal, administrative issues that confront you in actually trying to build uh, these tribunals and to do so oftentimes in the middle of the atrocities themselves or in the immediate aftermath of those atrocities. Um, <clears throat> it is a book, too, that tries to um, uh, address, uh, as, as in the title to this talk, the end of impunity. Now, of course, that's a provocative way of saying that what we're really doing is we're still chasing impunity uh, uh, in the international community. There are going to be many leaders that still evade accountability, including in the United States, and that's a reality that we confront and we have to deal with. And I want to talk about that a little bit uh, tonight. But let me just read one paragraph. It's at the back, it's, at, you know, it's on page 414 of the book. So it's sort of after the story has been told. Um, and it, it, it's a little more optimistic about this issue of impunity. But I want to read it to you because it gives you sort of the gem of the, of the point. There is no turning back now. Following the Cold War, the world of law and politics changed fundamentally. The first decade of the 21st century confirmed that transformation in the dockets of the war crimes tribunals. Impunity for atrocity crimes has been shorn of any legitimacy, even though some leaders doubtless will continue to escape the jaws of justice. The oldest rules of diplomacy and sovereignty will succeed at times in shielding a leader from accountability, but that will uh, be because of the limitations of a court's jurisdiction and not because there is any justification in law for a prime minister or army general or corporate propagandist to use his or her position of authority to assault a civilian population or violate the law of war. There remains no plausible argument for any privileged right under law to use the mantle of leadership or elevated power to incite, plan, or carry out atrocity crimes. No theory of exceptionalism should immunize those who plot and oversee atrocity crimes under the guise of national security, somehow expecting the rest of the world to understand unique we reasons why there must be torture, ethnic cleansing, or the disappearance of the enemy for the love of country. So that's what I try to tell the story of how did we get to that point of my actually making that argument. And the book tells that long journey through the 1990s with respect to those five major tribunals. Now, I will immediately tell you that, of course, I'm perfectly aware, and, and the International Court of Justice has confirmed this, that uh, the, the age-old principle in international law of head of state immunity and of other immunities, diplomatic immunities, all of those are still vigorously alive 
But what the International Court of Justice says is they may be alive as, as enforceable principles of law, but it, that they're not standing in contradiction to the issue of culpability for the commission of atrocity of crimes. In other words, you may be found as a leader responsible for the commission of atrocity crimes, but you may, depending on how the jurisdictional matrix works out for you on any particular day of the year, you may actually escape prosecution because immunity will save you on that day. It may not save you next year, but it could save you today. So that's, you know, the International Court of Justice is, is also addressing this issue, I think, in a very pointed, sophisticated way that we're not going to throw out immunity just because there are international criminal tribunals existing and just because we all believe, or I shouldn't say that, just because there is the advocacy of the principle of universal jurisdiction for uh, the, this issue of, the, of, of committing atrocity crimes. But it does mean that um, you have a contest now that is a very legitimate contest in international society between a rising tide of accountability among leadership uh, uh, circles for atrocity crimes and the age-old principles of immunity. And that contest will play itself out in very many, many, many different ways. And you know, we could go through one example after another. The classic one is President al-Bashir of Sudan today, indicted by the International Criminal Court. Now, does he have immunity when he travels? Does he have head of state immunity? Big question. One that the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court is tackling head on. Um, and it's a fascinating matrix of issues. And if you give me any particular country, I could probably say to you, well, uh, there's a good argument that, in fact, when he lands in that particular country, he has head of state immunity. When he lands in another particular country, he does not have head of state immunity. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rolling, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an evolving system right now that I think we have to be very sophisticated about uh, in assessing. But the rise of the war crimes tribunals in the 1990s certainly have changed the game uh, fundamentally. They also changed the game uh, with respect to what we call the subject matter jurisdiction of these tribunals, the crimes. Now, I call them atrocity crimes. Um, I do so because I think there's great utility at times in bundling these crimes together as genocide, crimes against humanity, serious war crimes, and soon with the uh, International Criminal Court, uh, if, it, it, if it is successfully amended, uh, the crime of aggression. Those are atrocity crimes, um, and it's quite useful at times to refer to them that way, and oftentimes it's not. Sometimes it's much more useful to use the term genocide or to use the term crimes against humanity. It depends upon the context. But certainly our understanding of and our ability to prosecute atrocity crimes has changed fundamentally in 17 years. It's a totally new world. You have an entire legal academy now that has acquired extreme, intelligent, sophisticated capabilities with respect to understanding what genocide is in, in a prosecutorial context, what crimes against humanity are and the breadth of them and the growth of them during the last 17 years, a much broader understanding of what crimes against humanity entails, uh, and that includes crimes of sexual violence, uh, the crime of ethnic cleansing, which we subsume under the crime of persecution, is a much, much better understood crime today. Uh, and finally, war crimes. <clears throat> you know, you can reach all the way back to the Hague Regulations at the beginning of the 20th century, and obviously going through the Geneva Convention of 29 and the Geneva Conventions of 1949 and say, well, of course, we have all the war crimes issues resolved uh, in those treaties. Of course, we know how to prosecute war crimes. I'm sorry we don't, so we certainly didn't until the rise of the war crimes tribunals. We had a very, very patchy system of court martials throughout the world, a very, very patchy record of which war crimes under what circumstances were actually prosecuted at the national level against usually very minor players uh, in the military, not the leaders. 
Um, so we, we, even with respect to war crimes, we were sort of starting on terra nova about how do you actually understand what is the checklist of war crimes, what are they under customary international law, and we didn't settle that until we negotiated uh, Article 8 of the Rome Statute. We really did not completely understand what is our knowledge of the checklist of war crimes under customary international law that we can run with in prosecutions in the tribunals. Well, Article 8 establishes that, that opening checklist of war crimes. Um, so for all of these reasons, uh, uh, it, 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 it's been a fundamental transformation uh, in the last 17 years. Um, finally, I want to, uh, not finally, but I, I do want to touch on, on a few other issues. Politics. Um, I think as you read this book, you'll see that the political dimension invades almost every single decision uh, relating to uh, these five war crimes tribunals. Obviously, you have the integrity of substantive law being brought to bear in our understanding of what the jurisdiction of these tribunals should be, what their crimes should be, how due process rights should be protected within the constitutional documents of these tribunals. So law is, of course, a big player. But at the same time, political influence is constantly present uh, in the room. And I try to explain that. Of course, I'm writing it as a, as a former US diplomat involved in negotiating these five tribunals and bringing the American perspective to the table. But I also try to give you some insight into what Europeans, Latin Americans, Asians were bringing to the negotiating table as their inherent interests in the particular issues at stake. Um, and that's a manifold range of, of political issues. And also the UN and the UN lawyers would constantly bring their equities to the table. That story is particularly told in the, in the making of the, of the Cambodia Tribunal and what the UN lawyers thought should be the appropriate way forward uh, from both a legal and a political perspective uh, on the Cambodia Tribunal. Um, and then there's, uh, let me just say, there are chapters in this book that deal with the creation of the tribunals. There are also um, other types of chapters. There's the chapter on the Rwanda <coughs> genocide of 1994, where I try to explain how U.S. policy evolved day by day, week by week, during those critical months of 1994, when the, both before and during uh, the genocide itself, and President Shattuck was a key, key uh, participant uh, uh, in the State Department during those months, uh, and uh, it was, and then in the immediate aftermath of the genocide, uh, we actually took a very early lead on trying to build uh, a tribunal that would address uh, that genocide. We did so, of course, recognizing as I write in the book, the enormous range of mistakes that we had made in our policy making in the earlier part of that year during the genocide itself, um, and uh, of course recognizing the mistakes that we had made during our Balkans experience as well. So there's a lot in this book that tries to reflect upon those mistakes and how we built upon them and tried to learn from them. Uh, and uh, there's a chapter uh, which I entitle Unbearable Timidity about the hunt for Karadzic and Mladic for five years, 1996, 97, 98, 99, and 2000. Why over a five-year period were not only we, but our NATO allies unable to capture Radovan Karadzic and Ratko Mladic? Why was that so difficult for so many years? And I tried to get some sort of uh, grip on that issue. <laughs> in that chapter. I was in the middle of it for five years, and I really tried to explain to you how difficult it was to focus every part of both the U.S. bureaucracy and the international community, the European community, on that very important objective of how do you track them down and bring them to The Hague. Are you focused on this every single day? Are you bringing the right assets together, the right intelligence, proper political will? Uh, are you not taking uh, uh, advantage of the situation to try to gain something on the ground by actually keeping them uh, uh, at large rather than bringing them 
to justice. All of those issues I try to, to articulate and explain in that chapter entitled Unbearable Timidity. And of course the end result is that when I left office and the Clinton administration came to an end in January of 2001, we had totally failed. We had not brought them to justice. And Karadich did not, uh, was not captured until 2008. I'll never forget um, a colleague of mine in the National Security Council in the year 2000 who was sort of new to the, to the venture. You know, he had been sort of circulated into the NSC for his tour of duty there, um, saying to me, um, oh, you know, uh, we're, we're never going to uh, have a situation where Radovan Karadzic uh, tries to walk around in disguise. I mean, you know, we're not, that's not going to fool us. Well, of course, when he was captured in 2008, he looked like uh, Santa Claus's grandfather. You know, he had, he had a beard going way down here and um, was clearly trying to walk around in, in a, a relative disguise. Um, and then, of course, Rodko Mladic was not captured until last year. So what I do try to uh, show you in that chapter is just how does this get so complicated and why is it that we failed? And then there's a chapter about Kosovo and the year 1999, and also 1998, the run-up to Kosovo, and, um, and, and the focus that we placed on the atrocities issue uh, in Kosovo during that uh, time. I, of course, focus on the atrocities side, but I also talk a little bit about the bombing campaign and the impact that had on my work as an ambassador at large. Um, so uh, that, that issue is also borne out in that chapter. Um, <clears throat> Let me do this. Uh, what I'd like to uh, conclude with is just a few thematic points that I think are drawn, how you can bridge this book, which is about the 1990s, and by reading this book, I think you get a much better understanding on how to address some key issues today that are confronting all of these tribunals. One is this uh, argument that's one so often here is about deterrence. Why is it that if you build these tribunals, you do not achieve deterrence in a fairly rapid space of time in each of these conflicts? In the Yugoslav conflict, how is it that the Security Council approved with such direct language the creation of these tribunals in early 1993, and we have the Srebrenica genocide in the summer of 1995? Wasn't the tribunal supposed to prevent that? Well, my answer is actually no. That was not the objective of the Yugoslav Tribunal. The objective of the Yugoslav Tribunal was not to bring the war to an end, to resolve all military and ethnic issues and political issues on the ground. The objective of the Yugoslav Tribunal was a criminal, a criminal law. It's to bring people to justice, to track them down, compile the evidence, undertake the boring, long, endless work of criminal law, and finally prosecute them and bring them to justice, either acquit them or convict them. That's what a tribunal is supposed to do. It's not your magical answer to deterrence. Now, we have that aspiration, and we even put it into the preambular language in the resolution itself that created the Yugoslav Tribunal. It's certainly our hope that it offers some deterrent value, that it tries to persuade leaders who are committing these atrocity crimes to stand down, that's a perfectly legitimate aspiration for the tribunal, but it is, I think, in completely incorrect to place the burden of ending a conflict on the shoulders of a criminal court. That's just not, that's not realistic. And I think so much commentary today, I read this op-ed in the International Herald Tribune last Saturday by Ian Paisley, I don't know if any of you read this, and he railed against the International Criminal Court uh, for um, failing um, to uh, end the conflicts in which it is currently seized. Uh, as if somehow the International Criminal Court has a magical power to end conflicts, that that is the purpose. In fact, he even says in his op-ed, the purpose of the tribunal is to achieve peace, to render peace. And all I can say is, he's dead wrong. That is not the objective of the tribunal. It's not the objective of the International Criminal Court. It's a nice bonus if it comes along, but that's not the objective of the court. The objective of the prosecutor is to acquire evidence 
and prosecute these individuals and achieve justice ultimately, and it's gonna take a long time. International justice is very complex. We're all frustrated with how many years it takes. Guess what, that's the name of the game. It does take many years. Um, we, we need to improve the efficiency of the trials. We need to ensure that we can try to conduct them as quickly as possible. But at the end of the day, they take years. And their, their purpose is not to literally end the conflict. Um, and we need to think, I, I think, just have a better understanding of that and not constantly subject these tribunals to the deterrence theory, uh, which is that their legitimacy rests upon whether or not they deter future crimes. Um, that's the business of politicians. That's the business of military leaders to try to bring that conflict to an end. They're the instruments of deterrence. The court, perhaps, it depends, situation by situation, whether individual perpetrators of atrocity crimes are influenced by the existence of that court to actually stand down and, and, and not commit crimes that they otherwise would have committed. That's a negative that's sometimes very hard to prove. I would suggest to you, there's an excellent book out by Professor Catherine Sickink, political science out of the University of Minnesota. She published it in, in September, uh, Norton Press. Uh, I reviewed it for the New Republic magazine. It's, it's a very, very good book. What she has done with her team of PhD students at the University of Minnesota is she looked back at the last 30 years of human rights prosecutions at the leadership level in Latin America and in Southern Europe, and she track and, and also uh, uh, prosecutions not only in the national courts, but also spill over in, into international courts or the Inter-American Inter Court of Human Rights, you know, regional courts of that character. So she took that whole matrix to determine whether or not over the long term do human rights prosecutions of leaders have an impact on local society? Do local societies diminish in their commission of human rights abuses as a consequence of holding leaders accountable? And what she found empirically over a 30-year period is that yes, they do. And that in those societies, you can draw a direct line to the quality and quantity of human rights prosecutions. And over a 30-year period, the, the diminishment of human rights abuses in not only those societies where they were directly prosecuted, but also in neighboring societies which are influenced by what they see happening across the border. And so that's the kind of research that I, I want to embrace, namely that over decades, you may see a real deterrence value uh, in these tribunals, but the idea that they're supposed to instantly achieve peace uh, which is what Ian Paisley literally argued on Saturday in the International Herald Tribune, is I think the height of folly. Um, there's also uh, another phenomenon, of course, and that is the, the argument that um, uh, is, is been, has been inspired by the war crimes tribunals, and namely to transform national courts into courts of universal jurisdiction. Now you know that, for example, the NGO Amnesty International has for almost a decade, I think, uh, pressed this issue very strongly of trying to get national courts to embrace a universal jurisdiction theory of prosecution. Now, uh, I'd be happy to talk about that in questions and stuff. I would just say that we need to understand that in the structure of the International Criminal Court, complementarity is strongly favored, namely, to delegate down to national courts the, the, the initial responsibility of investigating and prosecuting atrocity crimes, and only when they're unable to do so or they lack the political will to do so, or both, do you trigger the ICC's jurisdiction to actually address that issue. There's a failure at a national level, it gets kicked up to an international level. That's something we negotiated for years, I write about all of that in the book, in terms of how we, we in the United States government actually saw great value in that principle. And I certainly argued internally in the United States government, look, this is our big safeguard. We know how to do this in US federal courts. We know how to do this in US military courts. If an American becomes subject to the jurisdiction of the ICC, grab them, bring them back to the states, 
put them on trial. We know how to do this in our courts. Um, so that's the complementarity. The issue of universal jurisdiction is, is somewhat different, but I want to, and you know, I don't have to tell this audience all of, I mean, there are so many examples of how we've experimented with this in the last 10 years. Belgium is a classic example of, of the to and froing on universal jurisdiction at, at the national level. But what I do want to uh, state to this audience is a very interesting experiment is underway in the United States. There are now four laws on, I mean, there are four statutes on the law books now in the United States, which you can describe as basically near universal jurisdiction laws. And it's very interesting that, that this has happened in the United States. What are they? The Torture Act the Genocide Accountability Act, the Child Soldiers Accountability Act, and the Human Trafficking Accountability Act. All four of these, three of them I was very involved with, the latter three, Genocide, Child Soldiers, and Accountability, working very closely with Senator uh, Durbin of Illinois, who heads up a human rights committee of the Judiciary Committee in the US Senate. These laws basically are as follows, and they, they vastly advance US law with with respect to these particular crimes. If you're an alien and you commit genocide in Zambia, and let's say you're Zimbabwean, okay, and you commit genocide in Zambia for whatever reason, and you decide that you're gonna have that nice vacation home or permanent home, quite frankly, you know, next to Disney World in Florida and live happily ever after, um, you previously could have done that without any risk of prosecution in the United States no connection to the United States, you committed the crime of genocide outside of the United States and you're not a US citizen. No jurisdiction, even over the, under the old uh, genocide law, we had no jurisdiction over you. Uh, you can come and live happily ever after in, in Florida. This changes the ball game. If you're an alien and you commit genocide overseas and you land in Florida, you can be immediately indicted and prosecuted for genocide or you can be deported, that's, that's at the discretion of the Justice Department, deportation or prosecution. That's true for recruitment of uh, child soldiers, recruitment and use of child soldiers. It's also true for human trafficking, sex trafficking, and of course for torture. Under the Torture Act, we, we so prosecuted Chucky e. Taylor, you know, a number of years ago in a Florida federal court. Um, and we've just gone through a deportation proceeding under the, the Child Soldiers Accountability Act for a Liberian living in upstate New York, and there, there's a, a lot of pressure now being brought to bear on the Justice Department to transform that deportation order into a prosecution, an indictment in federal court of that Liberian living in upstate New York. So that is happening, and it is sort of near universal jurisdiction. The, the one contact is the individual has to land on US soil. So I just want to point that out, that that's another evolving trend, that even in the United States, there are some rather dramatic things taking place. And finally, I want to conclude with the International Criminal Court. I know there's always a tremendous amount of concern and interest in the relationship of the United States with the International Criminal Court. As you know, we're not a state party to the ICC. Hungary is. Um, all of Europe, all European nations are. All Latin American nations are. Many North American nations are. Some Asian nations are now including just most recently the Philippines uh, joined as a state party. Um, if, if you're interested in my take on, on uh, sort of why we're not there yet, uh, I'd be happy to answer that in questions, but I think the important point I want to make in the time I have is what are we doing to strengthen our relationship with the court as a non-party state? And I think that story is a very interesting one. The turning point was 2005 with the US abstention on the referral of Darfur to the International Criminal Court. It was clearly shown in the White House that we had US interests in stake in referring Darfur to the ICC. We also had a large religious pressure uh, uh, group you know, impressing upon the White House, this is the right thing to do. So we abstained. Uh, that's, of course, under the Bush regime, uh, you know, administration. Under the Obama administration, some very significant steps have been taken. First, 
the United States finally returned to the Assembly of States Parties meetings of the ICC as a very engaged observer state. We did this with the crime of aggression discussion in Kampala. We've done it ever since. Secondly, the United States deployed 100 military trainers to Uganda in October of 2011 to work with the Ugandan military to track and take down and send to The Hague the four indicted uh, fugitives of the Lord's Resistance Army, including Joseph Kony. And they're still in the field seeking to obtain that objective. Those of you who've seen the Kony 2012 you know, YouTube film uh, saw little snippets of US soldiers you know, with Ugandans uh, a military trying to uh, uh, undertake that mission. Uh, that's a very real asset contribution of cooperation with the court. Uh, we have used our authority in the UN Security Council to refer Libya last year to uh, the ICC. That was, that was truly US leadership. I think Ambassador Susan Rice, our ambassador to the UN, you know, she was with us on the Rwanda, she was with us for all eight years of the Clinton administration. She lived through the Rwandan genocide very, very closely uh, in the National Security Council in 1994. She has all of those memories with her, and I think they're being reflected now in the determination you see in Ambassador Rice in the Security Council. Um, that's a direct correlation, in my view, to that experience of the 1990s. Uh, and finally, Ambassador Rapp, my, one of my successors as Ambassador at Large for War Crimes Issues, is seeking to extend what we call the Rewards for Justice program to the ICC. This is a US program that, I, that was on my watch of the Yugoslav Tribunal and then the Rwanda Tribunal, whereby uh, funding is made available uh, to uh, in, incentivize individuals to come forward with in, uh, information that leads to the arrest of indicted fugitives. I think the United States is, is looking now at the possibility of making that available to the ICC. All of that boils down to this, that the, the cooperative, and also all of the punitive measures of the American Service Members Protection Act have now been repealed. Um, economic, military sanctions, all that stuff. And no one's negotiating Article 98 2 agreements anymore out of the US government. So all of that is, is actually a fundamental change in America's approach under the Obama administration. That, does that mean state party status? Not not in real time, no. Uh, there are other treaties that actually have more priority for ratification in the US Senate today than does the Rome Statute. Uh, and, and that's by choice. Uh, very important treaties, Law of the Sea Convention, Comprehensive nu Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. I mean, there are lots of other treaties that are stacked up in high priority for ratification, probably in the second term. But I do think we're making steps that, may I dare to say, so on some days, you could almost say that the United States is acting as if it were a de facto member of the International Criminal Court now. And that is a huge change from four, five, six years ago. Absolutely fundamental in the relationship between the United States and the ICC. I have probably overstated my time. Um, but you know what I'd like to do? Um, may I take just one opportunity to read one passage, one further passage from the book for you? And I think this is an audience that probably is interested in the ICC, the International Criminal Court, so I'll read a passage from one of those chapters. This is from the chapter, The Siren of Exceptionalism. And it's pages 196 to 197 in the book. And um, this tells you sort of one of the very, I mean, this happened all the time, but this was one particular day of dynamic development in our negotiating posture with respect to the International Criminal Court. In May of 1998, Madeline and I had tried to get a change in my instructions just before Rome so that we had a more plausible negotiating hand in Rome, one that we might actually prevail with. How about that? Um, and we had devised that strategy, uh, but we could not get principal's approval. There was gridlock in the principal's committee for changing my instructions as the lead US negotiator for the United States. So. Um, we had to go to the president. I called the White House and the chief of staff told me that the president was preparing for his China trip. John, you went with him on that China trip, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, so that was a big deal. You know, bilateral relations, China, very important. We have no time for you, David. So um, uh, 
I also knew that that was the summer of Monica Lewinsky, so all heck was breaking loose in, in the White House. But nonetheless, the chief of staff said to me, David, you know, what we could do is arrange a meeting for you with Hillary Clinton, the first lady. Now that may strike you as odd. She's not in the chain of command. She's the first lady. She's the wife of the president. However, I had actually gotten to know her. I think anyone that works closely with Madeleine Albright gets to know Hillary Clinton because they're very close friends. And I had many opportunities where I was with her and talking with her, et cetera. So I said, of course. I knew she had the president's ear. Of course, I'll meet with Hillary Clinton. So on that day in June 1998, Hillary entered the map room of the White House with Milan Verveer, her chief of staff, Eric Schwartz of the National Security Council, Jamie Baker, the NSC lawyer, and one of his deputy lawyers, and I took our assigned seats on the couch and assorted chairs. Hillary appeared tired and drawn, as if she had been through some kind of hell and back. I worried what that might mean for the fate of our discussion. But I plunged ahead, explaining precisely what Albright had set forth in the late May teleconference as the shift we needed in the U.S. negotiating position. Baker then weighed in with the Pentagon's view to hold firm on the long-standing American requirements. Hillary asked how the negotiations had gotten so convoluted with such complexities over jurisdiction. Why not, she asked, just have a global war crimes tribunal modeled on the Yugoslav tribunal, which was created by the Security Council? When this all got started, she thought we would simply reproduce the Yugoslav Tribunal on a world stage. I explained why the International Criminal Court would be a treaty-based court, independent of the United Nations, and that after years of negotiations, the situation had changed as governments expressed their largely negative views about the Security Council controlling a judicial process. Hillary expressed her amazement that the French did not find the International Criminal Court abhorrent, given that country's involvement in Africa and the exposure of their forces there. I explained that France was one of the most engaged governments in the negotiations and saw this as a means to lead in Europe and in the realm of international justice. I also knew that they were likely to sign the Rome Statute, perhaps even at the conclusion of the diplomatic conference, and they did. She absorbed without flinching Baker's condescending warning that since the president finally understood the role of the military, if he were to support the Pentagon position, President Clinton would earn the military's permanent respect and allegiance. And that meant he needed to go to, to back the current U.S. insistence on full immunity from prosecution by the court as both a non-party state and as a possible future state party to the court. In rebuttal, I reminded her of the futility of trying to attain full immunity that would extend even to our status as a state party and that it was undercutting our credibility to achieve major objectives in the treaty. Hillary paused to reflect, thanked us, and told me she sympathized with how difficult my job would be in Rome. I saw that as a signal that she would advise the president to back the Pentagon's futile position and that is exactly what he did. And then the story of Rome unfolds. So let me close there, and thank you very much for this opportunity, and I would be very happy to take some questions. Thank you, Professor Lewis. So, these stories, all of them are admittedly fascinating, but I guess they wouldn't exist without the individuals that live them and tell them. So a couple of questions about some of the personalities, if you don't mind, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, could, you, could you just, uh, just say who you are so that the oh, I'm sorry. ambassador knows and, and what field you're in, et cetera? Gladly. Uh, yeah, my name is Vladislav Simon. I used to be uh, Miklos Schwarzenegger's assistant at OSCE, Freedom of the Media, mm -hmm. uh, BA at, in Political Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, CEO at LLM in Comparative Constitutional Law with Professor Woods. Yeah. Now I have been in business and government relations, and I'm doing an executive MBA at the CU Business School. Excellent. And coincidentally, Michael Barnett, who wrote Eyewitness to Genocide, and who's the dean and Humph Humphrey chair at Minnesota right now, right. Um, talked about uh, 
whether Rwanda was less important than Kosovo. And I guess Madeleine Albright once said that she feels very strongly about Kosovo independence in her bones and her genes. And uh, the book is about certain people, Albright, Kofi Annan, being promoted after having perhaps uh, arguably <sighs> been eyewitnesses to genocide. Mm -hmm. So I, one question is, uh, was in fact to some Rwanda less important than Kosovo? And the other quick question is, uh, the late uh, Richard Holbrook, what was he like to work with? Oh, to work with? Oh, I'd love to answer that question. As to the first one, um, is, is Rwanda less important than Kosovo? Of course not. I mean, I had never heard this quote that you gave of, of Madeleine Albright. I, I don't dispute it. I mean, maybe it's out there somewhere in the record. But certainly, I, I'm expressing my own point of view that um, uh, uh, Rwanda, you know, I, I don't like to sort of prioritize these atrocities one over the other. I do sometimes, particularly when I'm talking about uh, Cambodia and trying to impress upon an audience the importance of still seeking accountability for the deaths of 1.7 million Cambodians in the late 1970s, that we still have to keep our eye on that ball, that we cannot walk away from it. Um, and so, uh, when I say that though, I don't try to prioritize Cambodia over other atrocities. What I, I basically say is remember, there are 1.7 million deaths in Cambodia, there were 800,000 in Rwanda. I mean, let's remember that as we seek accountability. Um, so uh, prioritizing is not, in fact, uh, I wouldn't want to do that. I've got five chapters in this book. I mean, not five, I've got many more chapters that are about the building of these tribunals. And I wouldn't want anyone to think that uh, the chapter about the building of the Special Court for Sierra Leone is any less important than the chapter about building the Ubisoft Tribunal. They each have their priorities particularly for the victims involved. Um, as far as Richard Holbrook is concerned, I want to tell you, um, it was a, um, I, I think President Shattuck, you, you'll have to agree with me on this. Um, he was a very dynamic, sometimes difficult man to work with, and also a glorious man to work with at times. Let me just give you this example. Um, I, um, I'll give you the, the, the tough side first, and it won't be, I mean, there are many examples of the tough side of, of you know, remember in the first four years of the Clinton administration, I was senior advisor and counsel to uh, Madeleine Albright, and that meant that I very, very often uh, had the initial conversation with Hol Mr. Holbrook before he had a subsequent conversation with Ambassador Albright, because I was the middle man. Uh, he would come to me first, and then I'd set up the call between him and Albright, and there'd be further discussion, etc. And uh, once he called me, and he said, David, I want to talk to Madeline right now about such and such an issue. And so I, I listened to him, and I said, okay, I think, uh, let me see if I can get through to her. So I got through to Madeline, and Madeline decided that before she wanted to talk to Richard Holbrook, she wanted to have just a, a few minutes discussion with Peter Tungoff, the Under Secretary of State, before she handled Holbrook's question. He was Assistant Secretary of State for Europe at the time. And, and Tarnoff outranked him as Under Secretary. So Madeline has her a few minutes with Peter Tarnoff on the phone. Meanwhile, I'm keeping Holbrook waiting. <laughs> waiting. And finally, Madeline comes back to me and says, David, I've talked to Tarnoff. Please tell uh, uh, Richard that. ABC. You know, I can't talk to him right now, but here's an answer for him. So I get back to, to Holbrook. I say, um, uh, uh, Ambassador Holbrook, uh, she can't talk with you at this particular point, but she wanted you to know the following, you know, ABC. So there's silence on the other end. <laughs> and Holbrook says, David, don't ever keep me waiting like that again. And don't carry the message from Madeline to me. I want to talk directly to Madeline Albright about this issue. Now, this was a normal day in the State Department with Richard. However, the next day, you'd be in a hallway with him or a meeting, and he would embrace you and praise you to everyone around him in the room. It was like you had just done the most spectacular work possible as a, as a diplomat's aide. 
So there was that kind of experience. But let me just tell you one other anecdote about Holbert, which I admire him so much for, but it was also quite a difficult uh, a adventure for me. Um, when he was ambassador to the United Nations and war crimes were before the Security Council, he would invite me up and say, Dave, I want you to be with me. You know, we're going to be talking about war crimes in Yugoslavia or Rwanda or Sierra Leone, something. Uh, and he would put me right behind him in the Security Council. I would have a seat right behind the ambassador over. And during, uh, you know, he'd lean back and talk with me and we'd be consulting and we'd be writing notes and then he'd make his statement. And he'd be there for about 45 minutes and then he'd turn back to me and he'd say, David, I've got to go on to something else. Uh, uh, I think we've covered this here, but I want you to stay and I want you to sit in my seat and represent the United States of America in the Security Council on this war crime. So I've already you know, mentioned you, you know, 10 times today to the council members in my statement, and he had. Um, now, I didn't have credentials to sit in the Security Council seat. I had no credentials. As an, even as an ambassador, you have to have special credentials to sit in that seat. And, uh, but I, I turned to uh, uh, Bill Cunningham, uh, uh, who was deputy pro rep, and I said, Bill, I don't, I don't have any credentials to sit in this seat. And Bill said, oh, heck, just do it, David. And so I, I went up and I sat in the seat. And of course, Lavrov of Russia stared me down. I mean, who am I to sit in the US seat at the Security Council? The Chinese delegate was totally confused. Um, <laughs> and then as, as Holbert was leaving, he'd say, oh, oh, by the way, David, afterwards, I want you to go in front of the press and you give him hell in front of the press, the right outside. You speak for the United States on this issue. You know, I got to go do something else. <laughs> and so <laughs> that was life with Richard Holbrook, and it was never boring, it was always exciting, and it was always controversial. <clears throat> Allegations 
against U.S. soldiers. I think it's a very poor record. I've looked, I mean, I haven't done a complete survey of it, but from what I've looked at, too often the answer is simply pay compensation, but do not look into the issue of accountability. Just pay off the victim or the family, but don't look at the actual responsibility of the soldier. Um, I thought the, you know, I, you know, you always, you always hesitate because you know criminal law is complex. You always hesitate to stand in the shoes of the prosecutor and say, oh, you know, I can't understand why this person wasn't convicted or why the sentence is life imprisonment, etc. So I'm always a little hesitant to, to do that. But I must say, when the news on Haditha came out about a month and a half ago, a suspended three-month sentence on Haditha, could someone explain that to me with some degree of rational explanation? And I think one of the difficulties we have, and something that I work on, that I've written about, is we have, and I, in fact, some of it's in the book here, we have an antiquated military justice code. It is frankly not modern. It doesn't equip us <coughs> to enforce the law against ourselves. Federal criminal law does not, of course, and this is true in many countries still, even those who have ratified the Rome Statute, they have not implemented the Rome Statute into their domestic criminal codes. That's a long-term project for many countries. Um, even France still struggles with that issue. Is, is the Rome Statute completely incorporated into French, you know, the French Penal Code? Um, so, in the United States, we clearly, you know, we don't have the capacity to prosecute crimes against humanity. So, if one of our citizens commits crimes against humanity, there's nothing in the Federal Criminal Code that says anything about crimes against humanity. So we have a long way to go to actually discipline our own legal codes, to revise them, uh, and then to ensure that we have the political will to investigate our own. And I am, I'm not one of those who supports the Obama administration's uh, policy decision not to look back at the so-called war on terror and to examine those involved in acts of torture and abusive detention policies. I think that examination should take place. I think that investigation should take place. Um, so I, I, I hear you, and I think the issue of double standards is a very serious one for the United States that we have to get a much better grip on. It's an honor for the Media Studies Center here at Syria. Thank you very much for the inspiring and exciting talk. And I would like to ask your view about the media case of the Rwanda court. Oh, so the media case, yeah. Yes, and, yeah. and especially from a First Amendment sure. viewpoint, yeah. and as, as a free speech NGOs and brotherhood the wonderful First Amendment scholar, the late Ed Baker, criticized the judgment that it, it sort of uh, supported uh, content-based restrictions. And I wonder whether you see a chance that somehow we can, we can uh, develop the jurisprudence of these courts towards being more careful with content-based restrictions and somehow develop instead uh, better understanding of what imminent danger can be in situations like in Rwanda or the Roman Yugoslavia? Well, I think I should first say that I, I do not object to the judgment in the media case. So I guess I'm going to be on the other side of the, of the bar on this one with you. However, you know, it's interesting in the media case, this is a case against the owners of the major media outlets in Rwanda, which just spewed out hate language in many different ways. And of course, the accusation or the allegation was that that hate language uh, incited genocide. And that was the issue the court had to come to grips with. What I think is so interesting with the media case, and these individuals, by the way, were convicted, but um, there was a vast change from the trial level judgment to the appeals level judgment in the media case. The trial chamber did go too far. They tried to show that all sorts of different 
uh, types of publications and radio broadcasts prior to the genocide can all be lumped together essentially as inciting, not necessarily the genocide, but something you know, like uh, crimes against humanity, that somehow that was demonstrated, and that you could take all of this prior stuff that one might argue is simply a, an expression of opinion prior to the actual killing um, and, and, and convict someone on that. The trial chamber so decided. The appeals chamber reversed the trial chamber and, and delivered a much tighter opinion that said, we're only going to convict these individuals on the use of the media that is directly tied to the actual killing in the genocide which means that the time frame, they, they selected just a few um, articles that preceded the genocide, and then in terms of radio broadcasts, they only selected radio broadcasts that occurred once the killing started. So their discipline with the evidence was much, much tighter at the appeals level, and I frankly think that had merit, that once the killing started, the media was used as an engine of the killing, um, and, and that's a big problem. Uh, which I was glad they were convicted for. Um, but the appeals judgment tried to impose some real discipline on this and said, look, you're nowhere near uh, you know, proving incitement on crimes against humanity. That count fails. What we can demonstrate is incitement for genocide. Once the genocide has started, the media is basically proven to have been used to continue the genocide, um, and so the, the 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 opinion was was I thought properly narrowed by the appeals chamber. And by the way, when the trial chamber judgment came out, even the NGOs who uh, so many of which defend the freedom of speech, you know, came out and just attacked the trial chamber judgment as being way too broad. I saw two hands in the back, and if you could come one after the other, because you have. Out of time. I think Javid was one of the first, and I don't know who the other one is. So Javid first. Hi, my name is Javid, as you said, and I studied at CU, uh, in studies. So well, my question is kind of continuing on the previous question. And I think um, what, what the previous question was asking, and if not, uh, the question I was asking, uh, what happens if uh, if a criminal law system, and that's all connected to the question, is that the actual purpose of international criminal justice is to enforce criminal law, right? Yeah. What happens if a criminal law itself is rotten? Is what? Is, is rotten, is unjust. For example, this criminal law system which says that the witches should be burned for lightning strikes. Okay, right? all right, yeah. yeah? Uh, if, so if, uh, don't you think that you're really restricting the purpose of international criminal justice to just Enforcing criminal law. Is it too late? I, I'm trying to understand your point. Are you right. saying, what if you have a corrupt domestic legal yeah, system exactly. and um, you're imposing just, international criminal no, law I'm on that saying, system? Uh, uh, will, that, uh, will that system, uh, or isn't, uh, isn't is the purpose of international criminal justice partly to, uh, to prevent such systems as to function? And, uh, oh, I see what you're saying. It's a really yeah. strong part of question. And that goes back to another point you made that uh, when, uh, for example, the question was about why the US is not joining the uh, International Criminal Court, and I have a regular article several years ago about the relationship between ICC and US, and I think it's a very good, good, good paper. But the question is that, that these examples you gave is precisely the reason why the US should join ICC, because what if uh, you have very good criminal law, but it doesn't work? Oh, I see. Okay. That it's unwilling, but I mean, yeah. you know, sometimes it's perceived yeah. that yeah. it actually doesn't work. Or yeah. another thing could be that U.S. businesses might not simply see something as a crime. Yes, I understand so, what you're saying. So, yeah. so isn't it just limiting criminal law itself uh, to, to uh, the criminal law to, to some uh, very specific objective? Uh, Don't you think you're a little sort of experiment? That's a general question, a specific question. Okay, I think I'm going to try to get a grip on that. Um, it is true uh, that you know the United States itself 
has its own weaknesses in terms of its criminal law. And therefore, one could argue, well, let's bring the Rome Statute and the International Criminal Court to bear upon the US legal system. My, my, I think my response to that, as a pragmatist, is what I would like to see, frankly, is the United States uh, revise its criminal justice system so that, in fact, it has the capabilities to run with these issues and prosecute them for these, these atrocity crimes, even long before the prospect of becoming a state party uh, becomes real uh, on the political scene, you know, with 67 uh, U.S. senators willing to, to vote for it. Um, uh, that's why, uh, at least my, my objective is, quite frankly, to demonstrate to the American uh, populace, if, if I may put it that way, um, that there's merit, aside from the International Criminal Court, we should be holding ourselves accountable for each and every one of these designated international crimes. This should be part of our domestic code, whether or not we ever join. Um, because even as a non-party state, situations can arise where the court would try to claim jurisdiction over the United States as a non-party state, let's take <coughs> Afghanistan. As an example, Afghanistan is a state party. Uh, the, the court could at any time try to take the initiative through the prosecutor to initiate a formal investigation of crimes in Afghanistan. Now, the United States is on the ground in Afghanistan, but it's a non-party to the court, but the territory is state party territory. If that were to occur, I would argue that the United States should be in a position to say to the International Criminal Court, look guys, back off. You know, we're perfectly capable of doing this and we're going to do it. And then judge whether we do it. You know, assess whether we do it. But we, I'm, I'm not, you know, we, I, I don't want a system in the United States that is so fragile and incomplete that quite frankly we run an even greater risk in the absence of those particular revisions to our criminal code. I see the hands, and I also can tell that we are running out of time. So I would like to thank David for the lecture. I would like to invite the people with the hands and also the others for drinks across that door. Thank you very much. Thank you.